Okay, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and uh, we've already, uh, uh, in the couple of weeks previous to this, <clears throat> I've looked through the first uh, five verses of chapter 1. So let me just kind of recap as you're looking for 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, when you think about the things that are going on in our world right now, uh, when I chose the title uh, for this study, I chose it from uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 12. And, and Peter says in verse 12, Now this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. And so I chose the title for this study as Standing Firm in the Grace of God in the Face of Suffering. Now, I had no idea at that time what was going to be going on you know, in our world as we're going through this coronavirus and all of this stuff. But I think it's a very timely study. Standing firm in the grace of God in the face of suffering. And uh, as we talked about uh, last time, you know, Peter is writing to uh, believers, he's writing to the churches that were suffering. Uh, we think that this was written somewhere between A.D. Uh, 62 and 64, and this was under the reign of Nero, the emperor Nero, and uh, he was a maniac. I mean, he was uh, persecuting Christians, and I mean, he was doing crazy things like encasing them in wax and then lighting them on fire. He was crucifying them. He was uh, throwing them to wild beasts. As a matter of fact, it was under the reign of Nero that both the Apostle Paul and Peter were both killed uh, for their faith. Uh, tradition has it that Peter was crucified upside down at his request. He felt that he wasn't worthy to... Uh, to be crucified the same way that his Lord was crucified, so he requested to uh, be crucified upside down. And so it was at that time, it was you know before the, his, his death, that he wrote these two letters, First and Second Peter. And so as we look at First Peter, he says in chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. So Peter addresses this letter to those that were in the, in the dispersion, what we called it, and he says the elect exiles, and they were elect according to the foreknowledge of God. And so right at the beginning, P Peter acknowledges that uh, you know he 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 dives into this uh, difficult doctrine of election. It's not difficult, you know, for those of us that that understand it, but it's difficult for a lot of people to uh, to grasp it and uh, to believe in it. So he addresses the doctrine of election that we are chosen by God before the foundation of the world. And then in verses three through five, last week we looked at. So let's read verses three through five. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And so... Last week, we looked at five relevant features of our eternal inheritance. First of all, the source. The source of our inheritance is God, God the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pointed out last week that the only true God is the God of the Bible. And the God of the Bible is referred to as God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. So nobody can truly know God unless they know God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the source of our inheritance inheritance comes from him <clears throat> and then the motive he says also according to his great mercy and so the motive for our inheritance is his mercy and then so how do we appropriate it the appropriation is spiritual birth you must be born again jesus said uh, <clears throat> that um, you must be born again in john 3 3 he said unless a man is born again he cannot see the kingdom of god and so the appropriation is through spiritual birth. And then he, uh, Peter describes the nature of our inheritance. He says it's imperishable, 
it's undefiled and it will not fade away. And so nothing can take it away. Nothing can destroy it. Nothing can tarnish it. And then the fifth thing is the security of our, our eternal inheritance. He says it's kept in heaven for you. And you think about it. Heaven is the most secure place in the universe. And so our salvation, our eternal inheritance is guarded and kept in heaven by God himself. And not only is our inheritance guarded, but we are guarded. Uh, Paul would write in Romans chapter 8, he says, uh, nothing can separate us from the, the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so we're secure. So we're going to go off of that and talk about this next section. Let's look at verses 6 through 9. He says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so in this section, we're going to talk about salvation joy. What do you think joy is? Well, let me ask the question. What is the difference between joy and happiness? What do you think? Happiness is a feeling and joy is more like a uh, you position in something. Okay. Happiness is a feeling, and joy is your position in Christ. Anything else? Happen happiness depends on happenings. Depends on circumstances. Joy comes from the Lord. Um, the Holman Bible Dictionary says this. It gives the definition of, of salvation joy. It says, It is the state of delight and well-being that results from from knowing and serving God. So it's the state of delight and well-being that results from knowing and serving God. And the idea, the word joy in some form or another is used uh, over 150 times in Scripture. So when the, when the Bible mentions something that much, it's kind of important. It's mentioned over 150 times. So when you think about it, genuine salvation and joy go hand in hand. They go together. You can't have one without the other. Salvation, genuine salvation and joy go hand in hand. As a matter of fact, joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit that the Apostle Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, and all the others that he mentions. Um, and, and so here we see that Peter wrote early on the subject, subject of joy because his readers needed uh, the reminder. They needed encouragement as they faced severe persecution. And you think about the world that we're living in right now. You think about the time that we're going through right now with this coronavirus and you know, all of these things that are happening. Uh, listen, people need reassured. They need encouragement. They need reminded that God is still God. Amen. He hasn't fallen off his throne. He's still God. And listen, this thing didn't catch him off guard. It's not like God is up there going, okay, now the coronavirus. Now, man, I didn't see that one coming. What are we going to do? We got we to formulate a plan. No. I mean, he's still God. Nothing catches him off guard. And so we need to remind ourselves and we need to remind others about that fact. And then let me uh, just kind of mention this, and we'll talk about it as we get into chapter 2 later on. But Peter mentions in chapter 2 and verse 12, he says this, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So Peter is, the implication here is though they were suffering unjustly, they should expect mistreatment and they should endure it with joy and patience. Uh, now again, remember who he's writing to. He's writing to believers that were suffering. They were being killed for their faith. And he says, listen, keep your conduct honorable. 
And so we need to uh, be reminded of that as well. As we're going through the trials and tribulations of life, we need to make sure that our conduct is honorable. What does, what does that mean? It means that it's glorifying to God. You know, we, we need to be acting different in the midst of trials and every other time. We need to be, Jesus said, he said, um, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, Paul wrote a lot about that as we talked about in chapel a few weeks ago. Um, you know, when we were going through chapter 4 and all of the things that he was talking about. You know, we got to put off, we got to take off the old self and put on the new self. And so let our conduct be honorable. And I think especially in a difficult time, especially in the time that we're going through right now, you know, when the world is in an upheaval, they need to see the light of Jesus in us. And so we need to keep our conduct honorable. Salvation joy is not some brief, shallow, circumstantial emotion, but rather it's something that's permanent and it's profound. You know, people can... People should be looking at us and going, Calvin, what is going on with you, man? How, how, can, you be, how can you be smiling in the midst of this, time, this, this, this coronavirus thing? It's because we can have that joy. It's a fruit that the Spirit of God manifests in our lives and that flows from our lives. And so, you know, salvation joy is not some brief, shallow emotion that depends on circumstances. Joy depends on the Lord. It comes from God. It's manifested through the Holy Spirit. And it's permanent and it's profound. It has a wonderful effect on people. <clears throat> and so Peter here in these, uh, in these verses, Peter gives five perspectives on salvation joy so that we as believers may triumph even in the most adverse circumstances. So first of all, he says, that we can have confidence in a protected inheritance. Again, notice how he, he, uh, he starts out verse 6. In this, that phrase points back to the previous section. It points back to our inheritance that is eternal and uh, it's protected. We can have confidence in a protected inheritance. And he says, in this you rejoice. Now, when you think about it, he's, he's writing to these believers that were being killed. Rejoice? Uh, are, are you kidding? You, you want me to rejoice in the midst of this? Yes. So here's the definition of this word rejoice. It means to be exceedingly glad. <clears throat> it means to be exuberantly jubilant. It doesn't come from changing temporal circumstances, but rather it comes from the unchanging, eternal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so he says, in this you rejoice. No matter what difficult circumstances or persecutions we may face, Christians can rejoice because of, think about this, the future hope that comes from, first of all, Christ's resurrection. Because Christ rose again, we are going to rise. Not only because of Christ's resurrection, but because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit produces the fruit that flows from our life. And then we can have uh, joy in difficult circumstances because of our secured, protected, eternal inheritance. Nothing can take it away. Miss that every time. Amen. Amen. That right there. Yes. It's protected. You can't lose it, man. Think about it. We didn't do anything to gain our salvation. We can't do anything, and, and we don't have to do anything to keep our salvation. Paul would write in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, he says, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion. So we can't lose it. So we can, we can be confident in a protected inheritance. Next, secondly, we can be confident in a proven faith. Look again at verses 6 and 7. He says, In this you rejoice, 
Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so we can have confidence in a proven faith. What does that mean? Peter teaches several principles of the troubles that God uses to prove our faith. First, he, he declares that their troubles are now for a little while. What does he mean by that? Well, I think he's saying it's for a season. It, 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 it'll pass. Just like this thing that we're going through in the world right now with this coronavirus, it too will pass. And so it's now for a little while. It's not going to be forever. It's, it's going to be for a little while. And, and, and again, we're going through nothing like those believers that Peter was writing to at that time. He says that God uses troubles. Um, and then he says, God, or troubles come if necessary. If necessary. So what does that mean? Well, they serve a purpose. God uses troubles in our lives. They serve a purpose in believers' lives. He sometimes uses troubles. I got six things here. God sometimes uses troubles to humble us. Sometimes we get feeling so high and mighty that we, uh, we, don't, uh, we tend not to depend on God anymore or we depend on Him less. We think we're doing this. We get, we get a cocky attitude. And sometimes He'll use troubles to bring us back down, put our feet back on the solid ground of Christ. So sometimes He uses troubles to humble us. Secondly, sometimes He'll use troubles to wean us from worldly things and point us towards heaven. Again, not only do we get to the point sometimes where we think that we're all that and we're doing it, we, we, we get to depending on the world, and we get to depending on the worldly things. And sometimes He uses troubles to bring us back to reality, saying, no, we need Him. We can trust in Him. Jesus said in John 16, 33, He said, in this world you will have tribulation. And then He said, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so what He's saying is, listen, as you're going through troubles, lean on Me. Trust in me. Come to me. I'll get you through this. And so sometimes he uses it to wean us away from worldly things and point us to heaven. Thirdly, sometimes God will use troubles to teach us to value God's blessings as opposed to life's pain. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. To value God's blessings as opposed to life's pain. You know, we, uh, it's easy for us to focus on the pain. Whenever the troubles come, whenever the trials come, it's easy for us then to really put our focus on those things, on the trials. And when you think about it, what we're doing, we're, we're, we're looking um, at God in light of our troubles. So the troubles become bigger than God. And what we need to be doing is looking at our troubles in light of God, who He is. And so sometimes he will, uh, he'll use troubles to, to help us to value life's blessing, God's blessings. Think about, you know, the Apostle Paul said, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. So if it kills me, okay, I'm going home. I'm going to be home with him in heaven. So, and again, we don't have to go through these things alone. We're not alone. Even in those times where we're feeling we're all alone, we're not alone as a Christian because He's with us. Remember, Jesus said, And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. He had reiterated uh, what, uh, what the Old Testament says, God, that God promises to never leave us or forsake us. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit that, that lives within us. And so we're not alone. So we need to value the blessings we have what the world doesn't have. We have the peace and the comfort and the joy and the confidence. All of those things that come from having the relationship with God. Um, and then next, he'll, he'll use troubles to enable us then to help others. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3-7. through 7. We go through things and we come out the other end 
And now we can then help other people that are going through those things. So he uses troubles to enable us to help others. Fifthly, I don't like this one, though. Sometimes, according to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 12, God will use troubles to chasten us, to chastise us. He chastises us for our sins, and he'll use troubles in our lives to do that with. And he, but, but again, according to Hebrews chapter 12, he chastises us because he loves us. And so if he's chastising us, then that means he loves us. Uh, a pastor friend of mine used to always say, sometimes God will take you to the woodshed. Mm -hmm. It's not a pleasant thing when God takes you to the woodshed. You know, you know what that means when you go to the woodshed? It, you, your backside's going to be hurting. Uh, but he does that because he loves us. And then lastly, uh, sometimes God will use troubles to help strengthen our character. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 5 and verse 3, that we're strengthened. And, and again, remember what, uh, what James said in James chapter 1. He said, Count it all, all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness or perseverance have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. So he'll grow us. He'll mature us through troubles and through trials. Even though we don't like them, they have a purpose. And then back in 1 Peter, he says, you have been grieved. And so here, I think he's acknowledging that suffering undeniably brings pain. Troubles undeniably brings pain. Not only is it referring to physical pain, not not you know, excluding, but not, you know, just, uh, it also includes not only physical pain, but also mental anguish. You think about it, whenever you go through difficult moments in life, it causes sadness, it causes sorrow, it causes disappointment, it causes anxiety. Think about how many people are having anxiety because of what's going on in the world around us. Think about how many people have anxiety they, that they deal with each and every day. And so uh, he acknowledges that troubles, you know, cause pain. Think about this. By God's design, God, uh, John MacArthur said this, by God's design, trouble needs to be painful in order to refine believers for greater spiritual usefulness. Saturday morning, John uh, texted me this psalm, and it just so happened that I had it written down in my notes already. Psalm 119 and verse 71. Psalm 119 verse 71 says this. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. And so there's a, there's a purpose. By God's design, they need to be painful so that we can be used for greater spiritual things. <clears throat> and then lastly, about, um, about this idea of suffering and about troubles, Peter notes that Christians experience various trials. He says, no, thou, though now you have been, um, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Um, Trouble is diverse. I mean, trouble comes in all shapes, sizes, and forms, right? I mean, there are all kinds of troubles in this world. But just as troubles are diverse, so is God's grace. God's grace is even more diverse. Think about this. There's no form of trouble that divine grace cannot supersede. There's no form of trouble that divine grace cannot supersede. Remember what uh, God told Paul in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul was pleading for three times, he pleaded with God to remove the thorn in his flesh. And God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for you. So in other words, no, but I'll give you the grace to get through it. He goes on to say, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength, God says, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And so Paul says that I'm going to boast all the more about my weakness. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Because God's strength through His grace comes in. And so 
even though trials are, uh, there's a variety of trials and troubles in our lives, God's grace is enough. It's sufficient to handle anything that life hands us. Think about this. God's purpose in allowing trouble is to test the reality of our faith. When we as believers come through a trial and we look back, we're, we're on the other end, and we look back and we're loving the Lord Jesus, we're still believing in Him, we're still trusting Him, then we're assured that our faith is genuine. Our faith is true. So the only way that that can happen is if it's tested. How do we know how much we trust God? You've got to go through it. You've got to be tested. You've got you to endure some things. And so we can have confidence in a proven faith. Thirdly, we can have confidence in a promised honor. Uh, verse 7, the last part of verse 7 says that we may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, true saving faith and its resultant good works always receives divine commendation. Think about it. We all live for those words that we'll hear from Christ himself. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. We, we, we work to, do, to, to get those, those rewards. It's not a bad thing to desire the rewards. That's what the Bible promises. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, that we as believers, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's called the Bema Seat. And we're not going to stand there to be determined as to where we're going to spend eternity. That's already been determined. That's already been purchased by Christ on the cross. But we're going to stand before uh, Christ to either lose or receive the rewards that we're going to be given. You think about this. According to this verse, it's an amazing truth that when Jesus returns, not only will believers faithfully serve Him, but He will graciously honor us. He will graciously honor us. You know, we, we work for uh, um, our rewards in heaven. He says, don't store up treasures here on this earth where moth and rust destroy it. He says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't, destroy, don't get in and destroy them. And so we can have confidence in a promised honor. Fourthly, we can have confidence in a personal fellowship with Christ. Look at verse 8. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Think about this. Love and trust are two crucial ingredients of any meaningful relationship. Peter here exalts those two aspects as essential to the believer's relationship with Christ and vital to the joy that results from those things. The word love here it has the idea of love of the will. We want to love Him. Now, we know the fact of the matter is, 1 John tells us that we love because He first loved us. And so He gives us the desire and the ability to love Him. Think about it. Do you love the Lord Jesus? Do you just love spending time in His Word? Do you love spending time in prayer with Him? Do you love, you know, and, and do you love the idea that someday we're going to be with Him? We're going to be in His presence. And so we can, we can have confidence in a personal fellowship with Christ. And it brings joy. Joy flows from a love for the unseen master, the one who believers also obey. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. Peter next, next commends his readers' faith and trust in Christ. He says, believing in him should go hand in hand with loving him. Though Christians do not see him now, we still believe in him. Remember what Jesus told Thomas in John chapter 20? He said, because you have seen me, you have believed. He said, blessed are those who do not see, and yet they believe. We, we, we believe in, in, in a God that we cannot see, but we know that he's there. We know that he's real, and, and that brings joy in our life. Think about this. Faith 
accepts the revealed written record of Jesus Christ, according to 2 Timothy. This is the inspired Word of God. And this inspired Word of God portrays Him in all His glory and leads us to love Him. To love Him. Do you love Him? Do you love His Word? Do you have... Do you have a love for reading his word? And you know, Psalm 119, that's it's, it, the whole psalm. It's the longest chapter in the Bible and it's all about the word of God. And do you love reading the word of God? Do you just get joy from reading the word of God? We can have confidence in a personal fellowship with Christ. And then finally, fifthly, we can have confidence in a present deliverance. Look at verse nine. He says, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Peter's not just looking at the future, but he's also looking at the here and now. Flowing out of our personal fellowship with Christ is the result, the salvation of our souls. Salvation refers to our constant present deliverance from the penalty and the power of sin in our lives. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 6, uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 2. We are delivered from the power and the penalty of sin in our lives. We are freed from the condemnation of sin. Paul talks about in Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are freed and delivered from the wrath of God, according to Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. The wrath of God is coming on the, those that... Uh, have not put their faith and trust in Christ, those that are still in their sin. We're delivered from that wrath. We're delivered also from sin's distress, confusion, and hopelessness. Think about hopeless, man. There's, there are a lot of people in this world that, that just are hopeless. They, they, they're just drowning in hopelessness. But see, we have the hope of Christ. We have the hope of heaven, and we can. It, it's a surefire hope because Christ was raised again to new life and he ascended back into heaven, we're going to be raised in new life and we're going to ascend into heaven someday. So we're freed from the, the confusion and the hopelessness. And then we're freed from sin's dominion in our life. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Uh, sin no longer reigns in our lives. We have, we, we're no longer subject to the dominion of sin. We can say no. We have the power. We have the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. And Jesus said this in John 15, 11. He says, I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. And so as we look at these verses, as Peter is writing to uh, believers that were suffering, tremendously suffering, he's writing to encourage them, to lift them up and to bring their feet back down on the solid ground of Jesus Christ. He said, my joy you can have. And when that happens, your joy may be complete. Amen? Amen. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord. Our Father, once again, we just uh, bow before your throne. God, thank you for the fact that salvation brings joy. Help us, Lord, to, to just be exuberantly, exceedingly um, tremendous in, in, in joy. Help us, Lord, to let our light shine. Let the light of Jesus Christ that flows from our lives, let it be witnessed by a watching world. Let them see you in us. Let them see in the midst of turmoil and trouble and strife in our world and in our lives. God, let them see that we have the joy of the Lord. That's our strength. And God will be sure to give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.